So my name is Michael Green. I'm a senior lecturer in Film and Media Studies. And today I'm going to be talking about my forthcoming edited encyclopedia called Race in American Film, Voices and Visions that Shaped a Nation. And through an introduction of this work, we'll discuss some of the concepts related to representation of race in American film, which is a very timely subject at the moment because our country is in the midst of another fraught era of race relations. We'll talk more about that at the end. So the way this is going to be structured is I'm going to introduce the material, talk for about a half hour or so, and then at the end we'll have a Q&A and you all are welcome to ask questions or make comments. Okay, so Race in American Film, Voices and Visions that Shaped a Nation, edited by myself with some input by Daniel Bernardi, a scholar, a race scholar, uh, well known in the field. So the first thing I want to talk about is this title, Voices and Visions that Shaped a Nation. Uh, we were uh, not too keen on this title because we felt that it didn't represent the reality of the history of race in American film, which is that it's pretty racist. Um, we wanted something that was more subversive, or that indicated um, the subversive nature of the scholarship behind race in film, right? That it's, a, that it's a scholarship of resistance to power structures. And I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. Uh, but this was less generic than some of the other titles they came up with. It wasn't quite as subversive as what we wanted, so this is what we settled on. And I guess it's true that if you look at cinema, it is voices and visions of various races and ethnicities that have created it, mostly white. So I want to talk about this idea of whiteness. I know some of you here are familiar with it. Others aren't, so I just want to set the context, because this is really the main theory that informs our work. So the discourse of whiteness. Whiteness gains its power and its legitimacy from the political scientific myth that whites are innately superior. Some ultimate result of divine intervention, natural selection, or cultural preeminence. And a long time ago, it was much more widely accepted at the beginning of the 20th century that there was a biological, there was a biological imperative to racial superiority. Most of us don't believe that anymore. Well, a lot of us don't believe that anymore. Um, I think this election brought into the forefront what a lot of people really do believe, um, that there is a racial hierarchy of where certain groups are considered superior to others. <laughs> So we're talking about the discourse of whiteness, and since many of you that just came in are my students from Introduction to Film, you know a little bit about this because we've been talking about it um, this semester. Whiteness is a myth of white superiority, legitimizes the ideological as biblical or evolutionary, the right of the chosen, the survival of the fittest. The myth rests on the ideology that people who do not count as white are inferior. Right? So this is, this is the the concept behind the idea of whiteness, that essentially that whites are superior, that non-whites are inferior, and that there's all these ways of proving that it's true, even though these, this proof is just ideology, okay? So who counts as white is actually a historical question. And this also informs our project because our project is historical. We have films going all the way back to the beginning of cinema in 1895, and all the way to last year. I think our most recent film is Straight Outta Compton. I actually also wanted to include The Revenant, but uh, that fell through. So what it means that it's a historical question is that the idea of who counts as white changes over time. And this is one of the ways that we can look at whiteness and realize that it's a myth, that it's not rooted in science. Because at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, Jewish Americans, Italian Americans, were second-class citizens, they were not considered white. Over time, they've assimilated into culture, and now they're considered white. A lot of who's able to assimilate and count as white has to do with 
physical characteristics, color of your skin, hair, lips, nose, things that other people can look at and say, you're different. That's why it's harder for some groups to assimilate than others into the idea of whiteness and all of the privilege that goes along with it because they don't look white enough. They can't pass for white enough. So this is one thing we'll consider as we look at films throughout history in terms of representation. So here's a quote from Richard Dyer who is instrumental in scholarship behind whiteness and racial theory in film. He writes, as long as race is something applied to non-white peoples, as long as white people are not racially seen and named, they, or we, function as a human norm. Other people are raced. They're black, they're brown, they're yellow, they're red. We're just normal. And this is the precept upon which cinema has rested, American cinema has rested since its inception. The idea that white is normal and non-white is other, okay? Vera and Gordon in their book Screen Saviors write, most white Americans either do not think of their whiteness or think of it as neutral. Now what's really interesting to me as a race scholar and uh, a film scholar and as a white person is to look at the way the scholarship and the theory from academia has very much infiltrated popular consciousness and popular culture. And lots of people now that aren't academics talk and write about the idea of whiteness and the idea of race and how we consider it. That's not something that was done for most of the history of film. But now we have legitimate debates and it's fact, it's one of the debates that have underscored this last election. So we can talk more about that at the end when we, when we ask ourselves the question, has anything changed? So just a few more slides of whiteness and then we'll move into some more uh, specific stuff about the, the movies in the book. At the interpersonal level, this is also from Vera and Gordon, the biological trait or set of traits thought to reveal race are used as assumptions about other physical, intellectual, emotional, or spiritual traits of a person with those characteristics. So in the U.S., for example, and of course different cultures around the world have different ways of organizing their, their bigotry and their racism. In the U.S., those who are not considered white are often automatically assumed to be smelly, greasy, less intelligent, lazy, dirty, not in control of their emotions, unreliable, and so on. And of course, we've all heard this a million times because we're all very familiar with these stereotypes. Some of us have to live with having the stere these stereotypes applied to ourselves. So, I'm asking the question to you, what, if anything, has changed since the beginning of film? And I'm using this still from the forthcoming Ghost in the Shell because Scarlett Johansson is taking some heat and the filmmakers are taking some heat for yet another white person stepping into the role that was originated by a non-white person, in this case, Japanese. Ghost in the Shell is anime. There's already some controversy brewing, as I said. That's not what I want. So Constant Wu, Constance Wu from Fresh Off the Boat calls Ghost in the Shell essentially blackface, the practice of blackface. She says, some people call it yellow face, but I say the, the practice of blackface employed on Asians because that's more evocative. And she wants people to think about why is a white star playing an Asian hero? And what she's saying is that this is not a one-off, right? We just went through this with what film? Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange. And Tilda Swinton playing a character that was originally an Asian man. Last year, we went through it with Aloha, and Emma Stone supposedly playing a nation. A couple of years ago, we had uh, Cloud Atlas, which actually employed the use of yellow face with white actors. So 
there's a body of, of evidence here that suggests that maybe things haven't changed, but I also believe that in some ways they have changed. So we'll be thinking about how they've changed and how they haven't. Okay, so now I'm just going to read a little bit from the preface of the book, and as I do, I'm going to show some slides with pics from movies to illustrate what I'm talking about. So here's from the preface to our encyclopedia. Race and racism has always been, have always been among the most popular and important of subjects in both Hollywood and independent American film. Um, the earliest Films from the mid-1890s were preoccupied with representing white America's obsession with Native Americans, African Americans, Asians, Latinos, Arabs, and Jews who were then not yet considered white. In this earlier era of overt racism, the subjects were almost always treated with the worst stereotypes. Native Americans were whooping savages, right, attacking white civilization at the frontier or they were considered noble natives. They were still seen as intellectually inferior, culturally inferior, but at least they were in the service of helping white men. And this noble, na noble native stereotype actually goes back to the 16th century. So cinema is just updating a lot of stereotypes that had already existed culturally. African Americans were lazy possessed inferior intelligence and were a constant threat to the purity of white women, as famously Gus in The Birth of a Nation. Again, here, a white actor in blackface, acting out some of the worst stereotypes of a black man. Latinos were bandits and greasers, famous shot from the treasure of the Sierra Madre. Asians manifested mystical stereotypes of Orientalism and the hysteria of yellow peril, which was the fear that Americans had of Asians in the early 20th century, of Chinese, of Japanese. And there were some really ugly stereotypes in film at that time, the Mask of Fu Manchu, the evil, mystical Asian, and then the dragon lady stereotype, often played by Anna Mae Wong here uh, in The Thief of Baghdad, which doubling up our stereotypes here. Arabs were hook-nosed bar uh, barbarians with scimitars. Jews were scheming and money obsessed. So here's the sheik stealing a white woman, again representing the threat, the other, the threat of the other to the, the purity of the white woman. And then not very long ago, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Just the, uh, the dumb scimitar-wielding Arab that Indiana Jones just takes out by shooting him. And then here's from uh, Cohen's Fire Sale. There were a series of movies in the early 20th century about this character Cohen uh, that were just very insulting to Jews. In this case, Cohen actually um, burns down his own shop to get insurance money. So it's playing on the stereotype of Jews being obsessed with, with money. Contrasting these early representations, films also perpetuate, uh, perpetuate an ideology of whiteness, which we just talked about, and they upheld white Anglo-Saxons as true Americans characterized by virtue, strength, superior intelligence, and civilized ideals. So the birth of a nation, right? A, a myth by the early filmmaker D.W. Griffith about white superiority. Stagecoach, white civilization at the frontier, threatened by the natives, directed by John Ford, who made a lot of films representing race in various ways throughout his long career from the 20s to the late 60s. John Ford is actually the most represented director in our book. He has 12 or 15 films, including The Searchers, the Lost Patrol, another John Ford film. These white guys go to the Middle East and they get pinned down and have to, have to fight off these Arab savages. Fortunately, that uh, stereotype has gone away. Um, 
Oh, whoops, no it hasn't. Lone Survivor, basically the same exact plot, right? Some of you might be saying, well, it was, it's based on a true story. This really happened. Well, it's not necessarily about what's based on a true story. It's about what stories we choose to tell and why do we choose to tell them over and over again. And in this case, you can see we're still telling these same stories. Later in the 1910s and teens, as film exploded in popularity with the general public, D.W. Griffith and other filmmakers perpetuated these stereotypes in thousands of shorts and feature films. So it wasn't just a handful of films here and there. It was thousands and thousands of films because films were made very quickly back in the early era of film, and there were a lot of short films. So you could churn out a lot more films than we make today when it takes two years to make a film, right? So there's a lot of evidence for this. It's not just a couple of random examples. And what's important to recognize is that these early filmmakers codified the language of film still used today. We talked about this in the film as well. Techniques of editing, cinematography, and mise-en-scene. And while they codified these techniques, they also codified the racial representation that these techniques would represent. So we think of film language, we're so used to it, we're also so adept at, at processing the language of film, the way films are shot and cut and staged, we don't think about it. But somebody had to make up all those shots and cuts and ideas about staging and acting and lighting in the early era of film when film was new. And so, as Bernardi argues, the development of film itself is inseparable from the development of way race is represented. However, even the earliest films still featured subversion and resistance to cinematic racism. Early shorts and features by white directors and even some films by Griffith, such as Broken Bo Blossoms, attempted to vilify racism and humanize non-whites, even while being problematic in many ways. For example, the fact that we have a white man playing an Asian in yellow face. Meanwhile, filmmakers such as Oscar Micheaux, an early African-American filmmaker, created an alternative cinema depicting the lives and concerns of African-Americans and others while attempting to minimize racist stereotypes. Here's another film called The Daughter of Dawn, which is believed to be one of the, if not the earliest film with an all Native American cast. So there was resistance, subversion, and pushback to all of this ugly racism and stereotyping. American filmmaking consolidated in Hollywood studios from the late 1920s to the late 1960s. And when it consolidated in American studios, some of this independent subversion, such as Oscar Micheaux, lost all its power because they weren't able to make films anymore. They weren't able to get distribution. So between the 1920s and 1960s, Hollywood filmmaking, or I'm sorry, American filmmaking was consolidated in Hollywood. And they produced movies that were almost entirely, almost 100% entirely from a male point of view, from a white male point of view. However, attempts were still made, often within what would later be termed social problem films or racial social problem films, such as Pinky, Gentleman's Agreement, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, that would dramatize the evils of racism, although almost always through the point of view of a white protagonist. And so some famous racial social problem films included Gentleman's Agreement, which starred Gregory Peck as a Gentile journalist who goes undercover to pass as a Jew to see what kind of bigotry Jews have to uh, under, undergo. The Defiant Ones, uh, one of Sidney Poitier's early films, again, about the evils of racism and how if, if white black people could just see eye to eye, racism might have a better chance of disappearing. A lot of these films would target racism as an individual prejudice, but they would not target racism as 
institutionalized as being part of a broader fabric that made it very, very difficult for people to change. Guess who's coming to dinner? Chris's favorite film. <laughs> um, another famous racial social problem film about uh, interracial marriage, trying to be progressive. And, and what's that? Failing. Well, it tries to be progressive in the sense that it's making a case for why racism against interracial marriage is wrong. But at the same time, it's completely seen through the eyes of the white patriarch and all the drama in the film turns on whether or not the white patriarch played by uh, um, Spencer Tracy is going to accept them. Dances with Wolves, one of many films in which a white man goes to a native culture and rises to become its leader and give them the, the help that they need because they're really incapable of managing their own societies or as I like to call it, Dances with Mullets. <laughs> the remake of Dances with Wolves, Avatar, exactly the same story, more or less. And then a movie like The Blind Side, which is about how, again, um, she's trying to show us the evils of racism, which is great, trying to show us some of the economic inequality and some of the opportunities that, that poor African Americans uh, don't have, but at the same time giving us this white savior character rather than seeing it through the eyes of the African American. Uh, other recent social problem films, because it's still a pretty popular genre as you see with The Blind Side, Crash, uh, Lee Daniels the Butler, and The Help. So what our books try to do is cover the most famous and important films from all three categories. And those three categories are films that are outright racist, like some of the ones that we showed you earlier. Those that attempt to subvert racism, however problematically, such as these racial social problem films. And then films by non-white directors that feature non-white characters or racial themes. So trying to bring a certain kind of authentic viewpoint Although that's not to say that just because you're African American, for example, it means you understand the entire African American experience. Just as it means that you may be able to bring a certain viewpoint and empathy to tell your, to tell your own story that a white person couldn't. So an early uh, film from the, from the 1970s, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song by Melvin Van Peebles. This is one of the first films that showed an African American protagonist actively resisting um, white police brutality. It was very controversial at the time, although it did become very popular as well. Made on um, basically a no budget. Um, American Me, directed by Edward James Almost, a film about experiences of Latinos and his, his character's experience in prison. Spoke signals directed by Chris Ayer, uh, one of the few films really by a Native American filmmaker. It's exciting that Chris Ayer actually wrote a, an entry for our, our encyclopedia. Better Luck Tomorrow, uh, directed by Justin Lin, a uh, different take on uh, Asian American teenagers that shows them as more complex um, people, more flawed people, not just the same old stereotypes, although many would argue that this movie does have Asian teenagers following the stereotypes. Instead of just being the math whiz, now they're the, the gangster. Um, but it is good to see that Justin Lin went on to some, quite a bit of power in Hollywood actually, uh, directing films that are actually uh, known for their multiculturalism, such as the Fa uh, Fast and the Furious films and uh, the, the new Star Trek film. Uh, Fruitville Station. Directed by Ryan Coogler, starring Michael B. Jordan, put them both on the map. And then uh, Selma, Ava DuVernay, right? Still very few African-American uh, filmmakers and even fewer African-American women. So these are the three different categories of films that we had to sort of pare down all the possible entries that we could have put in this, into this encyclopedia 
and uh, try to choose what we felt were the most, the most important for those reasons. And I'll show you just a bit of our So there's, uh, let's see, how many? How many entries did I personally supervise? 337 entries, plus all the front and the back matter, the ancillary materials. And as you can see, they, they span the gamut of history. But beyond just films, we also added what we felt were some important categories. Um, and so we have larger articles for Arab and Muslim representation, African Americans, Asians, and Latinos, for example. And as you can see, those are longer. Um, the African American one is 10,000 words, Arabs 4,000, early film, summarizing early film 5,000. Um, and then we have individual categories that we feel are important, individual subjects, such as, make that a little bigger, Imperial films, ethnographic films, uh, an entry on science fiction, uh, and an entry on westerns, blackface, miscegenation films. Miscegenation means um, the intermixing of races romantically or sexually. Um, so we have all these subjects, and again, these aren't just, even though this is an encyclopedia, I like to think of it more as a collection of articles, because they're not just little snippets of information. They really are um, long articles and each entry provides basic information about the subject, the plot summary, the, the dates, the actors, and so on. But we also contextualize it culturally, historically, in terms of reception. In other words, what do both scholars and average moviegoers think about these subjects at the time of their release? And how are these films and subjects perceived now through the lens of history? So while Race in American Film is based on scholarship. It has been written to be accessible, not only to high school and college students researching the subject, for whom we hope it will be an indispensable resource. Christmas list, ask your parents, I'm getting royalties. Um, but also to a general reader and film enthusiast, because this really is, uh, these really are volumes about history. So if you're interested in film history, um, you can get a lot out of these volumes. We have a, about 100 authors that contributed and so you really do get a diversity of voices, men, women, and all different uh, races and ethnicities, and um, gays and lesbians. We, we, we really have a lot of diversity here. So even after our first African-American presidency, early 21st century race relations in America are as fraught and crucial as ever. Racial struggles continue to define our national identity and our national cinema as much as they did over 100 years ago. Um, and you can see some of these recent films attest to that, right? Precious, A Better Life, The Help, Django Unchained, and et cetera. Because education remains the key to empathy and understanding, we hope these volumes can contribute insight and knowledge to those who seek it. So that's our mission. And I want that to lead back into our discussion. So I'm going to throw out a couple of ideas about what hasn't changed very much, in my opinion, based on the evidence, um, and what I think has maybe changed somewhat for the better. So, oh, I forgot to mention one thing that's important is that um, some of you may be wondering. Sorry. The introduction, uh, well, the introduction, which is separate from the preface, will define how the volumes consider race, but it's important to note for our purposes here that we do define it differently from ethnicity. So that is, say for a few exceptions, these volumes will not cover the representation of such groups as Italians, Irish, Polish, Russians, Germans, and Greeks. And the primary reason for this was just space. Um, we wouldn't have been able to get all those in, all those groups in, and have them represented in the way they deserve. Um, for example, an entire volume um, could probably be devoted to the representation of Italian Americans alone. So, uh, 
no stuff on Italian and Irish, such as John Ford's The Quiet Man or My Cousin, My Cousin with Vinny. I don't want, or My Cousin Vinny, sorry. My Cousin with Vinny? <laughs> My Cousin Vinny, which is a great movie, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, so, okay, so what hasn't changed much? Well, I think we can make an argument, or at least I can, um, that, that whiteness is still a main ideology of, in, in Hollywood, the way that we defined it. Uh, and if you look at Hollywood's main genres, what are they? Superhero genre, fantasy, science fiction, right? These are all still the domains of whiteness. Not only whiteness, but white saviors. The idea that a white, that a white person, usually a male, but not always, they have exceptions such as the Hunger Games and, and Mad Max, Fury Road, but usually a white male who's literally destined to save the world or the universe. And that recurs over and over and over again in virtually every Marvel movie, DC movie, Harry Potter, Star Trek, Star Wars, etc. cetera, um, with non-whites con continuing to be supporting, opposing, or marginalizing or absent altogether. I thought Civil War, uh, the most recent Captain America movie, did a really good job of, <laughs> it's the first time I've seen three African Americans in supporting roles uh, to the main white heroes. So we had uh, Black Panther, who at least is going to get his own film, and then we had, um, I don't know, Marvel people, who are the other two? Uh, who? Falcon and War Machine, boom, extra credit. Um, Non-whites behind the camera still obviously remains an issue, um, as do women behind the camera. We don't have enough of either. We certainly don't have enough of non-white women. Um, something like 80% of directors and, and uh, other craftsmen, craftspeople, uh, in Hollywood are still white. Uh, and a lot of these groups, Asians, Latinos, Arabs, Native Americans, and and African-American women uh, are still virtually not represented at all. Uh, there's really no Asian-American movie stars. There's no, certainly no Native American movie stars. And um, right now, we don't even have any new, hot Latino or Latina movie stars, which is crazy considering how much of our population they make up. And uh, so there was this article that I was reading. Uh, you may not have noticed, but there were almost no Latino films in 2015. Uh, and the article does point out that, yes, we still have a few Latinos in supporting roles, but as far as stars, they're not existent. Um, and you can draw your own conclusions as to why that may be, but oftentimes, if politically and culturally we're in conflict with a group, that group is either marginalized or absent from the screen, or they're painted as villains. And so, of course, we see that with Arabs and Muslims and another group that politically and culturally uh, is an issue for many Americans are um, Latinos, right? So that when we had uh, major Latino stars 50 years ago, such as Dolores Del Rio or, or Gilberto Roland or, or uh, Ricardo Montalban, um, we have very few now. Uh, and of course, as we, we, we talked about earlier, um, whites playing non-whites are still an issue, and we've certainly seen that uh, with the Asian films that I, uh, the Asian roles that I mentioned. Uh, another example would be like The Prince of Persia, Jake Gyllenhaal playing uh, a Persian. So what has changed? Well, you could argue that at least from the beginning of cinema, African American male representation is a lot better than it used to be. We do have major stars, Denzel Washington, Will Smith, um, Morgan Freeman, some that are on the rise, like Michael B. Jordan, and they do tend to get more diverse roles. Um, certainly, I would never argue that it's, that it's an equal playing field, um, but I, you, could, you could make a case that, you know, Denzel Washington, for example, gets to play a, a very diverse roles, um, anything ranging from, you know, Magnificent Seven to Flight to the upcoming Fences, uh, whereas we don't have representatives from other groups with the same power. We could argue that overt racism is lessened, 
right? We don't have, you know, actors in, in blackface dancing around with spears, right, anymore. We don't have Fu Manchu, right? But so I guess we could say that's, that that's progress. Um, talked earlier about the idea that public knowledge education um, has grown outside of academia. More and more people are, are aware um, of the way that we organize our, cultural, our, our culture, racially, socially. A lot of people want to criticize it um, and, and, and call it identity politics. Um, but as it's, it's telling that the people that typically want to criticize it in that way are white men. And if you've never had to deal with identity politics, then it makes sense that you would uh, not think it's a problem. Uh, public, uh, and then lower tolerance. I mean, we do see a lot more immediate protests to some of these issues. Um, for example, talking about Ghost in the Shell earlier. And then those protests, you know, another example might be Oscar So White, the backlash to the Oscars last year when there were no non-white actors nominated. And the ability for those protests to go viral and gain attention, right? Um, the way that we're able to distribute information more, de more democratically, that is more people, more people have voices um, and that, that information is able to travel so much more quickly and potentially go viral. Last thing I want to say is, because I thought about this, obviously I wrote this book before last week. <laughs> Didn't feel like it, but I did. Um, this was from today, a colleague sent it to me. This was uh, Pe Peppy Frog, is that how you pronounce it? Um, this this um, racist icon um, that uh, white nationalists are spreading, um, anti-Semitic icon, and this was posted on campus. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen a lot of, a lot of stories um, of, of things like this going on all over the country right now. Um, racist and, and white nationalists feeling emboldened by the Trump presidency. Can you say what the text is? No. <laughs> I can't see it. Yeah, she, uh, Sarah Florini sent that to us, and she described a little bit more about what it is. So, you know, for, for us teachers and, and for you students that some of you will probably become teachers, you know, what, how do we teach this stuff in, in, the, in the Trump era? Well, first of all, don't, don't despair. Um, that never helped anybody, right? Got to, we got to stay strong. We got to try to, try to fight the good fight. Um, don't preach, you know, we're all guilty of it, I'm guilty of it. Um, you gotta give them the evidence. You know, the way that I just gave you the evidence. It's absolutely staggering to me whenever I teach race and gender in American film, how people's minds change over the course of the semester because I just present them with so many examples of whiteness in Hollywood and racism. Um, that it's hard for them to say, oh, that's just BS, it's just, you know, it's just liberal, liberal rhetoric. Well, here's your million examples, right? So you really have to give them the evidence um, and have patience. Um, manage your ego and anger. Anybody that follows me on Facebook also knows that's a problem for me. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, it makes me angry that there's not more of a thirst for social justice, that people don't see that what we're trying to do is social justice. It's not, it's not trying to diminish white people or diminish any kind of group or take away their power. Education is key, so look for your opportunities outside your echo chamber. You know, face, posting to your friends is not gonna do it, right? They all, most of them believe what you believe already. Although I don't know with young people, because it seems like everybody that under 25 has like 700 or 800 friends on their Facebook page. So maybe, maybe they do have a more diverse, uh, a diverse group of friends that they can, they can interchange or interact with. And then recognize your privilege if you, if you feel like you have it or if you have it, like I do. Um, this is another thing that's sort of become a cliche right, lately, right? White people talking about privilege and drinking their lattes at Starbucks, right? Um, and Facebooking and about how awful everything is and then going home to their you know, upper middle class lives. It's, that's, not, that's not helping. 
And when I say recognize your privilege, we need to recognize not just our privilege here in the U.S., but around the world um, and how good most of us have it. Because nobody wants to listen to somebody tell them they need to change when they're already in a really difficult situation. And I know a lot of uh, working class white people feel that way. You know, so there's a lot to think about here. Anyway, um, that's the talk. What time is it? 2.45. So we have 15 minutes, and I'm not, I don't need to go anywhere if anyone wants to talk longer than that. So does anybody want to ask any questions or make any comments right off the bat? Yes, sir. I'll start by making this comment, uh, almost a complaint, is that I think you got the subtitle of your book is, is uh, backwards. You're not really showing how movies, that is, visions and voices, changed and shaped America. You're showing how America has shaped uh, film, because you have the, uh, the clearly racist films and stereotypes of the early 20th century, and then with the civil rights movement and so on, you have the changes, uh, the more sensitive and nuanced views. And you could never have you know, the overtly racist film like Birth of a Nation anymore. Uh, uh, the other thing I was wondering, you didn't mention any of the uh, uh, minority films. Well, what I'm saying is, the films like Spike Lee, Spike Lee's films, which, which basically portray the African American experience. Uh, well, I did mention a few. Purple, or I, I'm, I'm not a real. Well, the color purple is in our in our book. Um, it's an important film, but it is it is directed by by a white man, Steven Spielberg. Um, I did mention some in here. Selma, directed by Ava DuVernay, who's an African American woman. I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have been more specific here for those of you who aren't familiar with these directors. Um, Fruitville Station, uh, uh, Ryan Coogler is an African-American man. Better Luck Tomorrow, Justin Lin is Asian. Uh, Smoke Signals, Native American, and then American Me, Latino. So we do have a lot of these actually represented. And Spike Lee is thoroughly represented. There's like six or seven of his films. He's got his own entry, right? But yeah, there's no way you can talk about um, the way that American film has changed um, and representation has changed without talking about Spike Lee and his his incredible impact, especially in the early 80s and the, in the, in the, I'm sorry, the mid 80s to early 90s. And to your first point, yeah, I think you're right. Um, America has influenced film, right? They certainly has. Um, uh, it's definitely a reciprocal relationship. What else? Yes, sir. So this, is, this isn't necessarily a question regarding race and film, but um, for me, I'm a big fan of uh, Stanley Kubrick, right? And there hasn't been a film of his I haven't seen like two or three times. At the same time, though, I've, I've become, I've recognized that never once in any of his films did he ever portray a positive uh, vision of a woman. Um, as, a, as your opinion, obviously you've, You've seen a lot of film, a lot of it's been good, but it has had some of these elements that, that, are, really, that are really terrible. Um, how do you appreciate someone like Stanley Kubrick and everything he contribute, and at the same time recognize the faults of some of his films like that? Well, that's a great question. It's in some ways a key question, right? Like, when you know something is offensive, when you know something is racist and sexist, um, you know, how, how do you morally, I was having a, a talk with a student who came and asked me about this uh, the other day. How do you morally justify it? And, you know, there's a couple ways. Uh, one, you can, you recognize that those, that those people are products of their, their socio-historical moment. You know, what Stanley Krubick knew about women is what he learned about women, you know, and, and how women were treated during his time. And that doesn't necessarily justify it, but it might explain a little bit more about who he was, right, and, and how he came to those, to those ideas. As, as far as enjoying it, I mean, I mean, I, I grew up in the 80s, like I probably wouldn't be able to like any movie that I ever grew up with. That was a very, you know, white, conservative decade. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I, I think you, you either make the decision never to watch any of them, or you just, you enjoy what you can while recognizing that they're problematic. Maybe you turn your brain off. 
sometimes you watch it with a critical eye, and other times, if it's a Chevy Chase movie, you just try to enjoy it, right? I mean, I haven't come to one conclusion or the other about it. It's something I've thought about a lot. What else? What's up, Lisa? Um, this might sound like a stupid question, but how did the frog meme become like a negative thing? Because before the Trump pres or candidacy, like before, it was just like this stupid thing that went around that like came from a children's coloring book. So uh, I, I don't know how it evolved. I know it do it's done so quickly. Uh, maybe someone in here does. Does anyone know? I just read a little, but it was sort of appropriating by white nationalist groups to mostly on 4chan and Reddit. Yeah, and social media. And then they turned it into a, a racist meme rather than how it was originally. So we do know what the significance of the frog is? How can they turn it into a racist meme? <laughs> what they put around it. Oh, I see. It's what, it. Yeah, how they, different faces they put on uh -huh. it. And then they put a little, a little saying things. Oh, uh, you know, okay. Thought bubble next to Because right. one of my friends like texted me about it and He's African-American, but he was like so, in like so much hysteria, he was like, the frog is racist now, what is wrong, man? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, I mean, <coughs> what are you gonna do? Just don't use it, I guess. And they were saying, actually what I just read, it's not, every time you see the frog, it's not ter a terrible racist thing, but it's dependent on what it's paired with, and in the case of those posters, the text it was paired with was white nationalist. So it's not always inherently a god. So it's not so much the frog as much as what is said next to right. the Right, so and then the, yeah, those two, the image and what is the context are about. So I, I have a question. I just wonder if you have a thought about, because the, the Chinese market for American films is Increasing. I mean, there was the, the piracy problem for a long time, but is it increasing? It seems counterproductive to me to put someone like Tilda Swinton in an Asian role when you could potentially damage your international market so much. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure about Hollywood's um, thinking on this. I do know that they're, they're working to accommodate Chinese markets, right? Um, th for it example. It seems like you, your movie would sell so much better if you got an international you know, an Asian international star and put them in that part, you would, even if all you cared about was money, it seems like, it, I mean, that seems like a much more, if only, your only concern was money, that would be a much smarter economic move than Tilda Swinton, like how much does Tilda Swinton mean box office wise? Um, do a Chinese, you know, a Chinese movie star would mean. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure they've market researched it to within an inch of their lives and decided that for whatever reason, maybe because Doctor Strange doesn't have a, uh, much of a, a presence in China that it didn't matter in that case, or maybe that those particular films weren't doing well. Um, we certainly do see them, like for example, the way that the last uh, tra Transformers movie had a big part of the movie was set in China. That was deliberately um, to get that international audience. Um, and you do see some more, some more of these multicultural, some of these franchises trying to become more multicultural, like the Fast and the Furious, so that they can bring in audience, global audiences that can see somebody like themselves on the screen. Um, but as far as all the ins and outs, yeah, I don't know, it's a great question. Yeah, Justin, you probably know a little about it. Yeah, I, want to, I actually wanted to add to that. That was a question that I was gonna have for you. Going back to how you started with Scarlett Johansson and Ghost in the Shell and the decision to cast her in that role, I also wanted to include, and I know you mentioned it, but the Prince of Persia and getting Jake Gyllenhaal to play Persian for that role as well, which is very similar. Um, I was asked recently by Anonymous Content to uh, create a TV series for them um, which was based on the origins of assassins. So if anyone knows about the origins of assassins, it's 1100s, 1200s uh, in present day Iran, so the Middle East. And I put together a show deck for them where I had to create a bunch of different characters and in those characters you have to give character comps, actor comps, and you have to put in actors more or less that are bankable so that when the studio or the network or anonymous content looks at it they can see money in the characters that you've created so when i put together the cast i actually used you know it's primarily sunni um shiite iranian you know i used middle eastern actors persian actors indian actors and one of the first notes i got back from anonymous was 
who are these stars? <coughs> we don't know them, they're not bankable. We have to find the actors that are bankable, which meant who are the white actors. So I guess my question to you is like, in 2016, is it racism or is it a business decision? Or is it a little bit of both? Because in terms of bankability, you know, I get it. Scarlett Johansson is arguably the most bankable actor worth probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars at the box office just by attaching her. That's what you can get to your budget, get added to the budget. So it's terrible that Jake Gyllenhaal would play a person and you wouldn't get a Persian actor, but at the same time, I get what they're saying in terms of business and bankability. Well, um, this is where the, the idea of, of institutionalized racism comes in. You know, this is just these are just examples of, of the of, of um, an unequal system being continually perpetuated because of what's already been established for 120 years. Right? These are the star. White people are the stars. Um, the global hegemony of, of putting American movies in every movie theater, even drowning out local cinema, local national cinema. Um, so now that everybody is used to it, and that's why it's bankable, because we're all used to it. And so when does somebody say, well, I'm going to take a moral stand. Maybe we won't make as much money, but it's more important for me to tell the story in a way that I feel is more authentic. Now you see that more in the domain of independent cinema because the budgets aren't as big, right? And, and because you have a, a, for lack of a better word, a, a more thoughtful crowd that seeks out independent cinema, right? So, but it's very hard. It's very hard when, <laughs> when, when you're beholden to your stockholders or whatever and, and you have to make an argument for why you're, you want this, this film that they've invested in to make less money. You know, it, it's, it's, it's quite a problem. And, you know, maybe one that will change as, as, as demographics change. You know, the real, the real question is why aren't there any, any Latinos in movies right now and when they represent 40% of our population? And that's incredible. That's just total, that doesn't make any business sense cause, because, um, you know, as we see, um, when you put those faces in movies, people go to see them, like, like Tyler Perry's films. Yeah. Um, well, and also it goes back to it's, it's no longer really show business as much as it is business business. You know, it's being approached by major conglomerations, network studios, as in how can we make money oh, yeah. as opposed to what the content is. But one thing I do want to say, which I think is a glimmer of hope, is that now um, there are so many diversity programs uh, that are popping up at studios and networks, especially writing diversity programs. And so I've seen, I don't know if anyone watches the show Atlanta, um, which was written and created by Donald Glover, but his entire writing staff is African American. So, like, I think we're getting more opportunities to start representing those, uh, you know, to re start representing all the races across the board. But we need to start doing a better jobs. Well, and with Donald Glover, you know, he just recently got cast as as Lando in the new in the new Han Solo movie, and I guarantee you that because of his power and his popularity, especially among young people, that he is going to basically be a co a co-lead. He's not going to be like Lando and the original. He was just supporting. So, um, you know, in that sense, I think we'll see a change. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I know this is outside the scope of what what you're researching, um, but a lot of a lot of attention has been paid to what HBO has been doing a lot with their with, with diversity and a lot of their original programming, even back all the way to The Wire, which is now 14 years old. Um, do you see that television maybe is is making more progress in some of the in some of these in some of these arenas than than, than film? Well, I, you know, I deliberately tried not to go into TV too much because it's not my speciality. Um, and there's TV scholars in the room, but <laughs> I do think that you can make an argument that there's there's more diversity. Um, and TV right now, at least, um, we talked about fresh off the boat as one example. Um, HBO, eh, I mean, they do have that new show. Uh, what is it with the the black women? No, insecure. Uh, insecure, right? But at the same time, you still have their major productions are still very white. You know, Game of Thrones, Westworld. Um, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. We'll see, you, we'll see you next week. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I mean, maybe Michelle can, can throw in an opinion, but I think TV is a little more diverse. Um, certainly see more, 
more of a lat Latina presence there right now, don't you think? Well, you, in some areas, um, you start. You have a co-lead in Rosewood. You know, Rosewood's interesting because you know you have African American protagonists and co-leads at the one, and then Latina the other. And it and it did. It was picked up for another season. I thought that was interesting. I and mean, look at Luke Cage and what Netflix is doing. Um, and then Jane the Virgin is the big the big breakout one. It's in its third season, but who knows? I mean, who knows how long that's going to last. It's on CW, and CW right now is doing, there's so much transmedia storytelling with the DC universe that uses that um, there's only a couple of supporting characters, uh, or I mean, there's a, only a couple of Latinos in all four of those shows, and they're also supporting characters. Um, and, or, the, uh, you know, you've had some that were uh, villains. Then you have uh, like a presence in the Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., a little bit of a Latino presence this season. Um, started last season and this season, but um, it's still very kind of marginal. And yeah. It's, and it's a temporary, temporary, like they're not part of the core cast. It, it, um, and it always goes in I cycles. It's more nuanced, and that's what I call, what my work calls for. Yeah. So that helps. Well, um, we're just about at time, but I'll, I'll take any any last questions that anyone has. Yeah. Do you think that um, some of the bigger film or like yeah, the bigger films like Star Wars, they're having like a more diverse cast because it used to be like all white, and now you have people like John Boyega, Oscar Isaac, and even the new Rogue One cast, you got like Diego Luna and some that are like full Chinese, and there's even one that's like Pakistani. Yeah. That's going to have like a better influence on people. Than I think so. I mean, it'll, I think it'll be. Um, I, I don't think we're going to see real change until we start to see some non-white leads. But at least we're seeing female leads. And Rogue One is, is a great example of one that's definitely reaching out to that global marketplace by casting um, a, a real diversity, right, of of different uh, races and ethnicities. Um, what was the one you mentioned before? Oh, it was just like The Force Awakens. Oh, The Force Awakens, yeah. And, you know, these these films are also being targeted at young people. <clears throat> and young people are more diverse. They have more tolerance for diversity. They have more desire uh, for diversity um, in their lives and in their friendships. And um, it's more normalized for them. So a lot of it is, is the demographic. Well, we're talking about Star Wars. I have a question for you. Do you think um, the backlash that Star Wars got after the Jar Jar Binks character and a lot of the scholarship that had been done since the the original three Star Wars uh, um, I, lots of scholarship has been written about the white the issue of whiteness and yeah um, uh, and in sci-fi as a genre but you know specifically in this franchise um, and then of course so you have that scholarship about the first three then you have the pushback about uh, the characterization in the second three so do you think that this next installment this next part of the franchise then is aware of that plus the marketing dollars of the millennials yeah i think they're absolutely aware of all of that because um you know these are fan-driven franchises and the fans are online talking about this stuff all the time um so for sure and yeah, I mean, the, the embarrassment of Jar Jar Binks, for example, and, and the, the, you know, how easily it was to compare him to a step and fetch it character. Although, I have, I have read some very subversive stuff about how, some very interesting stuff about how, how the original trilogy was, trilogy was George Lucas's um, commentary on how embracing a white savior destroyed the universe. <laughs> because when they embraced the white savior and Anakin, and then everything goes to... Right, goes right, to right. S. So um, there's different ways to read it, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, our media, the way our society is mediated now, um, and the different voices that that are in dialogue, uh, certainly changing, changing things. And on that note, I know some of you have classes and other things to do. So thank you so much for coming. Um, certainly welcome to get a hold of me. Thank you. Welcome to get a hold of me if you uh, want to take a class of mine or ask me some more questions some other time. Michael Green, FMS, easy to find.